um, observation models, and so on and so forth. And um, so now let's talk a little bit about the representations, uh, which is the main topic of this talk uh, that we're using here. So basically what we're using is uh, really um, we're making a few assumptions so that we don't have to be learning, which is, for example, we know the geometry of the target object that we're what is supposed to uh, manipulate, so we can track it in real time. And the way this object is represented is with a uh, cut model, so just a mesh model. And uh, what we track is the sixth degree of the pose of it, so position and orientation of this object. Um, and this is basically the representation that is fed into the motion optimizer. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the same with arm tracking, we basically use joint angles as the representation. Um, we also sense torques, um, and uh, for the world we use the uh, box of grid, basically them to update. So that's the representation that we use, very traditional stuff works really well, as you can see. Um, but uh, we, as I said, like we use no uh, learning in here because we, we only try to solve tasks that we can actually model, for which we know what to do with robotics. So if we go towards past where it's not just about obstacle avoidance, but actually about physical interaction, making contact, and assembling things, we don't have so good models especially for um, contents and how objects react when we make contact with them. And that's actually where learning uh, can come in and actually help us a lot. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, about that. Another thing that has been picked up in robotics is the idea that perception is actually not passive, um, but it's actually active and exploratory. Um, so it's, it's not just seeing, it's actually looking. Um, and the way we perceive the world is shaped, so that's the idea that's being picked up in robotics, um, is that uh, the perception is actually shaped by the task and by the expectation we have about how the world changes when we interact with it. As well. And uh, there's a lot of evidence for concrete sites, of which I'm not an expert in, you, I think many of you are experts <coughs> in this, um, but let me give you a few examples um, that I find inspiring from a robotics perspective. Um, from the cognitive science literature. So first of all, um, humans seem to um, exploit multimodality. So they don't just have eyes, they actually have hands and skin uh, that they use to um, actually feel objects as well that they interact with. Um, so this is an example from J.J. Gibson, but not the important stuff, but actually from this book on the sense is considered as a perceptual system, um, where he looked at um, uh, how subjects are actually um, finding a particular reference object that is kind of a weird object like this among these uh, set of objects. And uh, basically what he found is that um, people who um, uh, can uh, not only look at the object and not only rotate the object visually, but can also touch them, they are nearly perfect in actually finding uh, these particular objects. Okay. Um, so there's some evidence that uh, people are much better, they can use all the senses that they have. Uh, vision and touch, for example, not even talking about sound. Um, there's also um, many perceptual tests that benefit from accumulating information over continuous time, uh, because if we observe something over time, it allows integration uh, over this time. And uh, some properties even only become observable over time. Um, Okay, so this uh, interesting example was uh, given to me by Octavia Camps actually when I was here in 2016. Um, and uh, who knows this? Nobody, great, except for Dagmar. <laughs> okay, so uh, what do you see in this image? Maybe a motorcycle. Mm -hmm. Maybe a motorcycle, yeah. Leaves. Leaves? Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, let me, let me resolve it to show you. <laughs> so, yeah, so, it, I mean, this is in a way a contrived example, it's in a way constructed, but it just makes this point that you, there's a certain amount of information that we can actually see better if we can accumulate information over time, right? Um, similarly, um, who knows this example of the cats? Uh, actually, maybe it's better. Okay. So, um, so this one I found pretty interesting as well. It's an old experiment that was done that shows how um, 
Uh, basically, the concurrency of ego motion and the sensory information is actually very important for developing um, certain meaningful behaviors. Um, so this is a so the setup is as follows. So these two very cool scientists, they um, basically raised uh, kittens in complete darkness, and the only time they were um, put into daylight was in this contraption, in this carousel. And there were two sets of kittens, passive kittens, here, who were always sitting in this basket. Um, so they could move their head, but uh, and I think even their paws could touch the ground. Um, and there were these active kittens that were actually walking. And you see, when this kitten walks, uh, the motion is translated to this passive kitten. So they are undergoing exactly the same motion, where, but this kitten has control over the motion. So it sees how its own motion relates also to what it perceives. Right, so this, this cat sees all the exactly the same, um, moves the same, but it's not controlling the motion. So then, um, these two researchers, they're taking these kittens and they're testing them on some um, test examples. So basically on visually coordinated behaviors like uh, walking along a cliff or not walking against a wall or things like that. And uh, the passive kittens are basically not very good at this. They're failing at this fast, but these ones are doing really well. Um, and also, they recover once they are put in a normal environment. But uh, it's kind of interesting to see that um, uh, the self-produced motion that uh, produces concurrent visual feedback is actually necessary for development of visually guided behaviors. And uh, yesterday I also found this interesting came, uh, uh, this example with the ellipses came up. You know, when you look at the cap uh, and you know it's a circle, or it's circular, um, but really the projection on your retina is an ellipse always, right? So how do you know it's a, it's a circle? And um, I don't know who brought up this example. Right. So, um, and uh, actually this example was also picked up by O'Reg Kevin O'Regan and Alba Noe in, um, in this huge journal paper from 2001, um, where they talk about the way we know that something is a circle um, as opposed to an ellipse printed is by the way the projection changes on our retina when we're doing the eye movement, actually. So really, this, uh, there is a, the representation um, is not passive, again, of what we see. It's actually active, or at least this movement um, and uh, the signal on our retina, they are somehow belonging together or intertwined. That's their hypothesis. And, um, okay, so in robotics, this has definitely caught on. Um, and um, maybe let's let's give it a name. So it used to be called Active Perceptual Trauma, focused on uh, Regina Wright. Right? She was uh, the main figure there, I would say. And it was typically focused on um, active vision. Um, but lots of roboticists are actually looking at physical interaction as well. We call this interactive perception. And the idea is that um, a perceptual signal is really uh, represented. Why am I using it? Why am I not using this? It's really represented in this combined space of uh, sensory data actions and over time as well. And um, now in robotics, the interesting part is that we actually have control over the actions. So we can actually say, we can ask the robot to check its own hypothesis. So it can form hypothesis about how sensory data will change uh, when it does a particular action, if it knows the effect that emotion will uh, produce, right? If it has a predictive model. So that's the interesting part of robotics. You just, uh, it just has the ability, just like us, to actually check. So we just don't know actually how it works in us, right? And also, robots are not very good at anything yet, so, despite all the videos that you may see. So um, anyway, we wrote um, a survey on this from the viewpoint of robotics. Okay, so we just basically throw down what all the robotics has been doing in exploiting this uh, signal in this particular space. <coughs> okay, so um, so how does um, um, this signal, this combined space, actually help? So it helps um, because if you physically interact, yes. What's the difference between this and learning and perception? Maybe if you're learning, there's no difference. It's all about it. So the question is, what's, what do you learn? Do you learn? Yes. Like your actions, if you want to learn something, maybe you try a different thing and see what the outcome is, and yes. then you learn that. So, but yes. you're, you're also using it when you're perceiving, not just. Right. Yeah. Uh, so there, I will call it. There's a difference between estimation. 
So using maybe the learned or not learned model of your, the causal effect of what, your, what the effect is of your actions on the environment, right? So uh, there, there is, the, I would call it estimation, I'm sorry. I, I, maybe I will get to this later, but I just want to make a few examples of how this is useful. So in robotics, specifically, if robot interacts with the environment, it can actually uncover um, more information than if it was just looking at things. So for example, it suddenly has sensory information in its skin, or it can see motion, particular motion in the environment, right? So that's, um, it's basically by interacting, it creates a richer signal that it can exploit. Uh, and uh, latent properties now can actually become observable that are not observable in a mirror image or by just staring at stuff. And um, also it can now use uh, this idea to actually plan goal-directed action. Because if it has an idea of how the world physically changes when it interacts, it can use that to plan forward, right, and to optimize the action to get to the goal. Okay, so, um, yeah, so basically, how can we think about the space as a predictive model, right? So uh, we want uh, a model that takes in sensory observation and uh, a hypothetical action the robot can do, and then tells us something about uh, the effect of it. If, if the robot had this, it can use this uh, to actually do, in a way, planning, right? Or uh, one um, popular paradigm of robotics is one predictive control for this which actually does plan forward for a certain time horizon, uh, executes the first part of it, and then looks again, checks what actually happened, and replans, and keeps going with that, right? So that's this model predictive control uh, paradigm that's very useful. Um, okay, so this is kind of what we can either, well, I will talk about what people do, how to get this predictive model. Um, but just about the outline of this talk, I will talk about two things, um, hopefully. <laughs> One is, um, uh, one idea of how we combine this physical model with a learning-based model um, and uh, how that played out. Um, there we actually fix the representation and learn how to uh, get to that representation from um, raw sensory data. And then uh, we also have some work where we learn the fused representation for vision and touch uh, to be a variant in the particular task to different shapes. Uh, um, of a peg that we try to insert, just as an example. <coughs> okay, so um, so what we want to do is to learn a predictive model. Okay, uh, and I will um, give you these two examples. I will use these two examples to explain this. So what people have traditionally done in robotics is to model physics, right? So they used a physics-based model by just looking at data and explaining it, whatever, with uh, Newtonian mechanics or something. Um, and um, so then this model also takes in a robot action, but certain assumes it has uh, knowledge of some certain physical parameters. For example, the weight of the object, or friction, or where the contact is made. Uh, and then they can predict the effect. And actually, um, I just took um, uh, these examples from a graphics professor, a colleague of mine. Um, and um, I have to say that these physical models are looking pretty good to me. So um, we, have, we have gotten pretty good at this, so this is just a bunch of fish, and there was soon uh, an octopus landing on top of them for some unknown reason. Um, and uh, then we can model clothes, or uh, things like this, like non-Newtonian fluid section. So I think our physical models, or the way we can actually model the world, looks pretty cool, unfortunately, uh, it looks pretty cool, but it's not necessarily reflecting, reflecting very accurately what's actually going on in the real world. So this is a very simple physical process of pushing a planar object on a table. This is what, orange is what happens in the real world, and uh, blue is what's happening with the physical model that you've just seen, right? right? So, so this looks very simple, but it's actually physically kind of complicated, you know, there's like sliding contact or sticking contact, depending on the friction of the object. Um, there is friction on the table, um, and um, so it's not it, it's very low dimensional system, but it's actually physically quite complex, and we're not very good at this, especially if rotation is bad. Um, okay, so the challenges with using physics based models is first of all, how do you even get to know these parameters from raw sensory data? How does the how does the robot get to figure out 
what the weight, what the friction, or the contact point exactly is of the world. Um, then uh, this physics-based model uh, may actually be inaccurate, or it may be very expensive to compute. So all these examples from graphics I've shown you takes whatever, I don't even know, like hours, most likely. And um, yeah, as I said, also the predicted effect is actually mostly approximate. Um, so what have people done? Throw machine learning to the problem. <laughs> so, um, successfully, of course. It's, uh, it's, it's very impressive also what can be done. So uh, basically, they replaced this physics first model with the with the deep neural network um, to actually uh, go from sensory observation and action to predict the effect directly in the observation space. Um, and this is one example. Okay, I just picked up one uh, from Charles from 2016, where uh, you see a robot basically pushing around objects in a, in a great box, uh, just a very small uh, time scale. This is the ground truth what's actually going on. This is what the model predicts um, is going to happen. <coughs> and you see it's kind of it's kind of right, but it's also kind of blurry. And also this only works if there's a gray box, right? I mean like literally it only works in that particular viewpoint for this particular robot for this particular great box. And um, so um, so this is pretty impressive. But the question is generalization here, right? So I don't remember how many data points we for example needed to actually train this particular model. This is the burning ongoing or is this uh, something where you train it and then you just let it loose and uh, but I mean be useful, I would think the learning would have to be ongoing. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, that's another entirely other question. Contin it's called continual learning, it's yeah. the new hot stuff, yeah. Yeah, so that's that's another very interesting challenge, like how we can even stop doing this batch learning and actually continue uh, learning without forgetting. Yeah, but I'm not going to talk about this at all. It's not uh, predicting the uh, pushing the yellow block at all. Say again. So, it's only moving the arm, but not the blocks. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's not perfect. Like any physical block. So, and also, this is not going to be perfect, but it's um, uh, there are some interesting properties. So, our hypothesis is uh, from my student and I was um, so even though physical models are not hundred percent accurate, they actually do bring you in the right ballpark, and. Um, so if we combine learning and uh, analytical models, um, what we hope is that we actually should get implicit regularization, require less data, uh, and provide better generalization to new situations and, and new actions, new shape of, of objects, okay? So that was basically our hypothesis. And um, so, um, oh yeah, so actually it's accepted. For now, but yeah, if you want to know more uh, with all the experiments that we have done, you can look at this paper. So, what have we exactly um, suggested or proposed? So, what we propose is basically a model that combines these two words, learning and physical modeling, uh, into one model. And specifically, uh, what we use learning for is for um, the perception part. So, we keep reusing, if we know it, a physical model of uh, the process that we are looking at, for which we know good parameters. And uh, we use learning for the difficult part of actually extracting uh, these particular physical uh, parameters from the raw uh, data. And then uh, we still um, use also the input of robot action and predict the effect um, that the environment should undergo and uh, then train the entire uh, hybrid model end-to-end. -end. Um, and uh, we were basically mainly interested in the question of whether this particular hybrid model is actually able to uh, extrapolate beyond uh, the training data, okay? So, okay, so how do we test this? So basically what we, need, uh, what we needed is a lot of data and a process for which we actually have a physical model. I will, the later part is about a process for which we don't have to do. Okay, so here um, we basically use this planet pushing task that I already showed you before. And MIT, just around the corner, was so kind of collecting one million data points for us of actually having this particular very precise robot pushing uh, these different objects, object shapes on these different interchangeable 
uh, surfaces that have very different friction. Um, they uh, basically push with different velocity considerations, uh, but they unfortunately forgot to record visual data, so we had to actually generate this ourselves. Um, and uh, so we generated RGB and uh, depth data based on the motion capture data that they had. Uh, so this is the kind of data that we had, a lot of data. And uh, we also have an analytical model that I showed you before that is approximate um, for modeling the surgical process of plant pushing. So basically what we, what we have, we have, we have an object, the robot is pushing at a particular contact point uh, in a particular direction. Uh, this is the U here, P is for the pusher, um, C is for the contact points, it's in relation to the center of the, of the object, and what we want to know is, okay, where is the object in, in the image, um, depend, independent of shape, uh, what's, uh, what's its rotational velocity and what's its rotational velocity. And um, I just want to very briefly go over this analytical model, but basically, uh, it's a two-stage model. model. It first figures out, oh, is uh, the contact actually uh, sliding or uh, sticking? So if basically this U is outside of the friction cone at this particular contact point, uh, it's sliding, um, otherwise, uh, sorry, it's sticking, otherwise it's sliding. And um, basically if it's sticking, then uh, the push velocity at the contact point is the same as the uh, control input. Um, if it's sliding, um, then uh, basically uh, the push velocity is uh, the closest motion cone. So once we have the um, push velocity at the contact point, uh, we know the first, we complete the first stage of the model, and then given that, we can compute uh, the linear and angular velocity of this uh, object. Okay, so that's very quick for the analytical model that we have been using, and actually plugged in here. Okay, well this part is learned. Um, this uh, analytical model uh, sitting here, and these are the physical parameters of basically where the contact point is, um, uh, what the contact normal and these kinds of things we are trying to estimate from the data. And this is how the detailed model architecture looks like. Um, I will actually skip this. I mean, it's a bunch of convolutional pairs. We already heard about those. So, uh, but essentially, this the raw sensory data is input. There's a bunch of convolutional layers uh, that I actually learned to predict. Um, these particular physical parameters here. Uh, there's actually also a contact indicator, so binary variable, um, that we have to make differentiable, uh, so it's a, it becomes a sigmoid. And then uh, what the output is is the object position and its velocity, okay? And also there's the robot, um, there's also a robot action that forms the input. Okay, so uh, then uh, as output, we have the effect. And uh, the last function, which is printed here, basically looks at uh, the difference in the predicted versus the ground truth effect of this push action. Okay. Um, okay. So what we wanted to know here is um, uh, we wanted to know <coughs> how good are we at interpolation, extrapolation, and generalization to different shapes. Um, and uh, we compared our hybrid model with a pure neural network model um, and uh, an error model um, that basically learns an error on top of um, this physical model. Um, so uh, these, these architectures actually share the perception part. Um, they basically are different in whether they use the physical, uh, the model of the physical process or not. And all of them take in raw sensory observation and they're trained end to end. Um, so, um, just about data efficiency, so maybe not surprisingly, um, the model that actually uses the physical process is more data efficient, because of course we don't need as many um, weights that we have to learn. Uh, so maybe more interesting is to see like how much more data efficient it actually is. So if we have just 2,500 examples, um, then there's already uh, quite a big difference here just shown for the translation of the object. And we need orders of uh, one order of magnitude more data, so this is a logarithmic scale, um, so that uh, the pure neural network model catches up with the hybrid model. And um, by the way, this gray line, that's what the physical model is predicting. That's the error that the physical model is doing if it takes ground truth information as input. Um, so what you also see is that at some point, actually, the neural network, given enough data, um, 
the neural network actually becomes better than the physical model, um, while um, the hybrid model is bound by the uh, by the performance of the physical model. So, so that's kind of it. Uh, that's kind of what we expect. Yeah. So basically, that means that your physical model is not correct. Yeah. Because also, if you put all your effort in estimating yeah. the parameters, okay. Sorry. So, so, so you didn't get make a statement. Uh, no, well, does that mean right? that your physical model is, is lacking some... Yeah, so it's not correct, right? right? It's yeah. just a ballpark. Mm -hmm. So it's inaccurate as well, right? Mm -hmm. And any yeah. model would be mm -hmm. always. So, yes, so um, this is the error that the physical model makes, right? I will going to show you later how the learned model actually compensates for the error in the physical model as well. Um, okay, so this is kind of expected. This is also a task where this is on a data set, on a test data set, where the model only has to interpolate, okay? So it's the training and the test uh, distribution of the data is actually the same, so that this uh, pure neural network model was better given enough data is actually expected as well. Okay. Uh, this is the error model, I'm not gonna talk about this. So what we really wanted to know though is um, how well this hybrid model is doing in terms of uh, generalization. So we tested interpolation where we had like uh, same object basically um, being pushed at, the, uh, at um, with different push velocities, uh, different contact points. We looked at extrapolation, so there we train on a particular push velocity and test on slower and faster ones. And we also looked at different uh, testing on different shapes. And I'm just going to look at this particular. Um, uh, this particular case of extrapolation in detail. So here again, you see basically the error and predicting what the object is doing as a function of the push velocity. Uh, the training velocity is this one. Um, and uh, this is the uh, slower velocity, and the faster velocities. And this gray line is the error that um, the analytical, the sort of physics based model does. And you see it actually also getting worse because the assumption that it makes is that. Uh, it's a quasi-static assumption. So the faster uh, the object moves, uh, the worse also the physical model gets. And uh, this is what the hybrid model does. So it does slightly worse, um, given, um, um, basically it's also by the physical model. Keep in mind that the physical model takes in the ground truth parameters, while the hybrid model takes in the raw sensory data and actually has to infer these parameters, okay? Um, and this is what the uh, pure neural network does, okay? So um, the, the further and further we move away from the distribution of the training data, it obviously gets worse as well, okay? Um, this is what the error model does, which I'm not gonna talk about in detail. So, um, so basically, just summarizing the results, so what we basically achieved by using knowledge or structure that we know about the physical process is that we get better data efficiency and we can also generalize over uh, better over actions and shapes uh, and actually extrapolate beyond the 3D. Okay. Um, so one of the um, so one of the lectures um, I mean you also have to think that this is a robot, right? So you want to actually not connect uh, a million data points just for pushing uh, on a table or for grasping things from a gray box, right? Um, so that's why it's useful to not throw away structure if you know something about the um, and uh, we also showed you that if you know a good state representation that is useful, uh, this is probably what you want to learn to extract from uh, the raw sensory data to then use the structure that you know uh, about in that physical process. And we made a concrete suggestion on how this would look like. And here's another thing that's good about actually using a, an explicit state representation. It actually remains interpretable. So you can since you are learning actually where the contact point is, what the normal is, you can plot these things and uh, uh, what this uh, model is actually uh, doing. And also, if you use it in a controller, you can actually close a meaningful control loop uh, on it and potentially even have guarantees uh, for what you are doing, right? If you learn a non-interpretable representation, that's really hard to do. So, um, so the, the analytical model does make errors, as I showed you before, right? Especially it's really bad at uh, predicting rotations. Um, so what we did here is we just uh, gave the model the wrong friction parameters um, as input, 
And uh, here's what the what basically the hybrid model is doing in that case. It's actually saying that um, the contact point must have been here, right? Or uh, the normals are also flipped. So it's kind of manipulating these physical parameters uh, to compensate for the errors in the model. And now what you can do with that is, for example, to say like, oh, but visually I see that the contact point is somewhere else. So if you correct for that, you could also try to estimate again the correct friction parameter or maybe the mass uh, of the object. Right? And uh, this you can really only do if you have an interpretable explicit state verbalization. Right? So if you have something like that, you should really use that. Um, okay, so I just talked about this uh, pipe where we actually used, um, I have 10 more minutes, right? looking at my, at my time. Yeah. Okay. Oh, wait, you, we started a little bit late, so okay. Yes. So, okay. So, um, we talked about this, where we use an explicit representation of the state, and that is what we extracted from Ross and Figueira. So now, uh, I want to talk about an additional modality. We only talked about vision so far, but we typically have in us, but also in the robot is uh, sense of touch as well. Um, so, in that case, it's actually really hard to do what I just showed you because you don't really have a good physics-based model, especially if you don't know the shape. So um, this is now, there are certain processes or certain manipulation actions that want to do that are really hard to model. Um, so, uh, but in, so peg insertion is one case where if you know the shape of the peg, uh, you can actually model uh, this case. Uh, for relatively simple shapes. So this has been studied in automation and robotics since the 70s or whatever. But if you don't, uh, but if there are a lot of uncertainties, uh, if you don't know exactly the shape, or if the shape is complicated, you actually, uh, you're, that's going to take uh, quite a while of engineering. So what you have though is, um, you have to complement the senses in the robot, uh, vision and touch, uh, and they show you how they are exactly complementary. So here you see this robot on which we did this experiment, trying to insert this tag. So first it has to basically align with this box. So you see some uh, free free space motion until uh, it hits this box. And you see a spike in the force truck sensor data. Then it's sort of like searching for uh, this hole and sliding on this box. So even the visual motion is pretty constrained. And you see a very particular uh, signature actually in the first arc information as well. And then as soon as it's uh, uh, finding the hole, it's actually inserting it, and you see a spike again in this data, and the downward move motion in the visual data as well, right? So these two sets are really uh, concurrent uh, as well. And there's a particular signature. Um, so, um, so what we wanted to know is if you can learn a representation of these two very different um, modalities, um, and we wanted to test it with this very classic robotic stuff, which is peg insertion, um, using these two modalities. And typically, people assume they know exactly what they are trying to insert. And we wanted to know if we can actually generalize over different shapes. Um, yeah. So there's also, if you're interested in more detail, there's this preprint uh, on archives. Um, and uh, now we are going to mention deep reinforcement learning. So basically, what we do is. Uh, we take this sensory input data, so RGB image, force of data is just 6 dimensional. This is uh, 240 times, um, uh, 640 times 480 image, right? And we also use some proper receptive data, so where the end sector is relative to the world frame. We encode this into some lower dimensional representation and uh, then learn a policy uh, on top of that that outputs end vector space. Okay? So the interesting part is actually how the uh, representation is learned here. Um, again, we learn it through a predictive model. So these are uh, the sensory information that we put as in, uh, use as input. They're encoded modalities specific. Um, we use them. Um, these are all uh, neural network layers. And then, um, given also a robot action, we decode them again uh, over time. So what are these uh, decoders? So basically, uh, we having we chose three different ones that all predict over time, or two of them actually predict over time, and are actually action conditional. So the first encoder says like if the robot moves uh, in that direction, this is going to be the visual dynamics that the robot is going to see. So the optical field in this case, 
also, if the robot moves in this way, uh, it will make, um, basically, it will make or not make contact in the next uh, time step. And also, we have a pairing loss, which basically just decides if the input was actually time aligned, so if it was actually concurrent. So these were the three losses that we used. Just to train this lower dimensional representation that is capable of predicting over time, given also. And um, this is what we then, uh, this is what we learned offline. And the interesting part here is that no um, manual labeling or something is actually required from a human. The robot can actually label all this data by itself by just uh, doing some trials. Right? Because we know the, the, we know the geometry of the robot and the kinematics, so it can actually label these images and contact or not contact all by itself. So it takes kind of like half an hour to actually connect this data just to learn this representation. So this once we have this uh, representation learned, we um, we grab a, a deep reinforcement method around it. It's KRPO, but it's not so important. Uh, that actually produces an effective displacement. And uh, what we found is basically that uh, we did a bunch of population studies, uh, and what we found is that um, uh, this is the average return for the robot, so the robot gets a return when it actually inserts. Uh, so basically, the higher this is, the more often the robot has actually achieved its task of inserting uh, the peg. And uh, you see that it's um, um, basically doing best if it uses both modality. Um, and also, if it only uses vision, it actually stagnates. Because at the moment when it's actually trying to do this uh, manipulation task where contact becomes or touch, essentially touch becomes very important, um, there's not much visual information anymore. It's very small displacement only. So that's where you see it actually stagnates if it only has that visual, visual information available. Um, OK, so I'm going to wrap up. Um, we did some generalization results in the real world as well <clears throat> on these different uh, pegs with different clearances as well. So the smaller the clearance, the more difficult it is. And this is actually how it looks like when the robot is um, kind of had five hours uh, per peg to actually uh, learn this. So these are the different uh, pegs. Um, in each of these cases, they actually be, uh, managing to insert this. That's how it looks like. And um, also, we showed that when we learn a representation on one particular peg, it actually generalizes uh, two different uh, pegs as well. So, um, so this is basically using the same policy you learned for one uh, peg, how it actually works uh, with a different one without retraining. Uh, and this is an example where it just uses the representation that was learned. Uh, so it can actually reuse that, although it had never seen uh, necessarily this peg. Uh, we also have some positive examples of how it recovers from different motivation. So this is Michelle just basically pushing it. This is the first drug data uh, up there. Uh, and we'll still be able to uh, actually insert it at some point. Trust me, it's inserting it. Uh, here's, uh, she's basically perturbing the, um, uh, this first drug sensor information. So you see it's actually reacting uh, to it, <coughs> and then still manages to actually insert it. Um, we also moved it around. We actually, t uh, it still needs a lot of data. Very annoying to collect it on. Uh, to basically have a robot five um, hours uh, training. Um, so in simulation, we also train for different uh, position of, um, uh, <coughs> Yes. Probably wrap up. Yes. Anyway, so this is a visual perturbation, and um, yeah, so I'm at the end of my slides. Um, uh, so what did I show you? Uh, I basically uh, showed you here how we can uh, learn a predictive model in the case where we don't, where it's very difficult to model this process. And uh, we trained uh, the representation to predict forward, uh, but then we actually threw away this predicted effect. Uh, and just um, grab the model free reinforcement learning method around, which is maybe not the smartest. I think a model based method would be better. Um, uh, for sensory observation, we use vision and touch. And um, just to conclude, <coughs> so 
what I showed you here is that actually uh, for a robot to understand how its own action and sensory, uh, uh, sensory data actually hangs together um, uh, is very important and can be exploited to learn a representation or also for planning. And um, I showed you these two um, different applications of this. Thank you. Um, you, you showed very beautifully <clears throat> examples where the number of degrees of freedom of the physical system are also small, and so perhaps, therefore, it's not a yeah. yeah. But perhaps there's something to be said for the opposite. If I have very soft interactions, then you can essentially move much of the complexity out into the physical world, and because you have these soft yes. interactions, you get a lot more freedom, and in that sense, it's somehow con not contradictory, but complementary to the degree of freedom problem associated with control to yes. what would happen if I had yes. a physical system and lots of freedom. So, okay, so first of all, all our robots are controlled by a manner so that we get away with some uh, any curious from the perception part, right? So it doesn't matter if the robot uh, makes initial contact because it actually nicely gives in, just like us. Um, which, so this is the controller that we use in uh, uh, very small games. But you were saying if the physical system is also compliant and soft, it has a high degree number of degrees of freedom, uh, and then it's forgiving. Yeah. Is that what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, that's my question. Um, but if you're trying to reach a particular goal, uh, it's giving, but still searching from the current state to the goal state uh, has to still go in a way through that high dimensional state space, right? So it's it's uh, still a very difficult to search for. Right? I see. Yeah. Okay, fortunately, we have to keep keep moving, but we'll have more chance to ask that question very much. So thank you again. <laughs>